to Dr. Ismail um, from our side. Uh, and uh, it's our great pleasure. And uh, uh, we feel sorry also we have bothered you uh, so early in the morning for this talk. That's fine. <laughs> no problem. Uh, uh, um, this is uh, IPS Platinum Jubilee Lecture Series. And uh, yours is the 24th, 25th lecture. Uh, I welcome you on this uh, lecture series, sir, on behalf of Indian Phytopathological Society, um, New Delhi, India. Uh, now I'll uh, request uh, our IPS president, Dr. Pratibha Sharma, madam, to uh, give a welcome address. So very, very welcome, uh, Dr. Adnan Smile. It's very good morning to all of you and good, good afternoon to all my Indian audience. So welcome to over for this particular series. And as we know, Dr. Adnan Ismail, today is a very important topic. And of course, it is a very favorite topic of mine, trichoderma. And I actually, I really wanted you, Dr. Ismail, to be also the participant of our satellite workshop on trichoderma, which will be conducted in international uh, this thing, uh, event, which will be conducted in the month of March. But we are very fortunate enough to listen, especially because since you have worked with... Uh, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Gary Samuels and so we always wanted Dr. Gary Samuels also in the last uh, international workshop I uh, requested him to come to India then he said no I'm not well okay. it's very difficult to me to come so had this COVID, of, uh, COVID problem would not have been we would have really been fortunate that you would have come to India oh, and yeah. deliver your lecture so very warm welcome and uh, welcome to all our other audience and our uh, scientists to this particular uh, uh, talk series so I think Dr. Jambulkar will introduce Dr. Adnan yes. Ismail and then we can start with the lecture thank you very much thank you thank you very much madam uh, it's my great pleasure um, and I feel very happy to introduce Dr. Adnan Ismail to this August audience uh, of India. Uh, and it's as Madam says that it is our very favorite topic, topic on which you are about to present, sir. I will give a brief uh, introduction of Dr. Smile. He did his uh, PhD from Virginia Polytechnic State uh, University. Before that, he did MSc and uh, um, BS degree from Baghdad, Iraq. Uh, presently, he is working as a microbiologist at U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, Bellsville. Uh, he has a uh, number of publications uh, and uh, specific, specific, specially on trichoderma. He has a significant contribution uh, in this field of uh, taxonomy of a tri uh, uh, trichoderma. He worked as a microbiologist at USDA uh, since studying the fung uh, fungal taxonomy. Uh, along with a very famous uh, trichoderma taxonomist, Dr. Gary Samuel, uh, who identified a number of species uh, for the genus uh, trichoderma. And uh, I feel very happy to inform you that, that Dr. Ismail was all along with me for at least as many as 11 to 12 years um, in the work of trichoderma. He was involved in the revision of the uh, longibricate clad of the trichoderma. He, uh, at the same time, he has, was also um, associated in a classical work in which uh, they have reclassified the trichoderma asperulum on the basis of uh, various techniques using, my, uh, along with the mycological techniques also, in which they have found the two cryptic, cryptic uh, sister species of the trichoderma asperulum and uh, a third morph morphologically distinct um, species uh, of an asperulum. So I feel very glad and uh, so much thanks to you, sir. And I welcome you for this uh, lecture series. And now I request you to uh, deliver your lecture. Most welcome. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. That was very kind of you, all of you. Thank you. And I'm so glad to meet all of you and be able to uh, present this seminar to you. So the title, as you see it, it's Taxonomy of Trichoderma, Trichoderma Taxonomy, Biocontrol, and Agriculture. Let's go to the next slide. So where, where do we find trichoderma? Uh, trichoderma habitat. So usually trichoderma is present in soil, on organic and inorganic materials, on mushrooms, 
and sometimes on uh, as endophytes of plants. And it has been known that it's uh, they are in as uh, they exist as endophytes in rubber and cacao. Cacao is also is known as plant of chocolate. So, and in less common habitat is immersed marine and uh, animal feed and indoor niches. Uh, why trichoderma has been so successful? Well, the first reason is they have ability to inhibit other fungi and you all know about it, mycoparasitism and antibiosis. And these are the two common ways they inhibit other, fun other fungi. And production of hydrolytic enzymes to degrade complex carbohydrates. Uh, we all know about cellulase and chitinase and after they, they work on plants, they would be able to have some ca complex carbohydrates that can, they can feed on. And if you are familiar, very familiar with trichoderma, you know that they have some, some cultures have some smell. And usually what I remember the smell was, uh, uh, or uh, looks like uh, uh, yeah, order of coconut, coconut order. So that order also inhibits other fungi, and it has been proven that that's the way it works. And uh, trichoderma grows very fast, and that's an advantage. Growing fast is always an advantage to deprive others from nutrients and dominate the habitat. Uh, so what's important about trichoderma? Importance of trichoderma and why is so much talk about it? As I said, they are enzyme producers and some of the enzymes have been used commercially in animal feed and improvement in juice extraction. Then antibiotic, antibiotic producers, and they have ability in biocontrol or they have been used in biocontrol and this is known since 1930s. And soil fertility. We know that uh, trichoderma comprise significant amount of biomass in soil. And with that, they can uh, recycle, detoxify, mobile nutrients, antagonize pathogens. Uh, and that's the way it will make the soil more fertile. Uh, some species of trichoderma have been shown to be pathogens for humans, especially immunodeficiency people. And the species responsible for, oh, sorry. The species responsible for this is trichoderma longibratiatum. And the reason for this is that this species, longibratiatum, has the ability to grow at 37 degrees. And we also know that some trichoderma causes disease in mushroom. And the species that causes that disease is identified as trichoderma aggressivum. And in fact, Dr. Samuel identified this and described it as we see in the next slide. This, uh, all this, this clade, everything in this clade was herzianum, described as herzianum. But Dr. Samuel saw that this is a separate clade, and these were all isolated from mushroom compost. And he described them and uh, called them aggressivum. And he uh, named two aggressivum, aggressivum F europeum, aggressivum F aggressivum. So aggressivum is the pathogen of mushroom and it affects production uh, a lot. Uh, this slide is from Cuba, Dr. Kubacek's paper, more recent one, it's in 2019. It tells us about what are the most common species of trichoderma. So if you were, so this is based on number of publications or uh, record in, uh, in public yes, yes. journals. So we see that, uh, as you see, the bigger the ball is, the, that means it's high number of data available about that uh, species. So Herzianum and virus is very common 
and a lot of publication and a lot of, a lot of records available about them. And here also longibratiatum, especially just longibratiatum, sacrimonium longibratiatum. And here, hamatum and aspirella are very common. Don't speak in here, here, atroveridae and gamsi also very common. The rest are not that common. And this, uh, according to my knowledge, this, the, this data is really correct because I have done survey of soil uh, from South America, from Africa, from United States. And these species are, are the most common ones and the most you would be isolating if you do surveys in, from soil. Uh, this, this slide, I will show you some history about the uh, history of taxonomy of trichoderma. So it started in 1794, uh, Dutch, uh, Dutch taxonomist identified, uh, called uh, a green mold trichoderma, and that was the first reference to trichoderma. In between, until 1939, not much happened. Uh, Bisbee tried to identify species within trichoderma, but he really didn't do much. He just called, he said that everything within trichoderma is just one species. So basically from 1939 until 1969, whichever isolate you work on is just trichoderma veridae, just one species. He just said there is not much phenotypic characters that you could identify species with. Then in 1969, Rifai, uh, who was a student from Indonesia working in England, uh, was trying to do a monograph for trichoderma and uh, he identified nine species aggregate. Species, he called them species aggregate. Basically he was, he was uh, admitting that this aggregate could have more than one species. So he identified nine aggregates. So that was the first, the first uh, reference that people, uh, we were able to have more species within trichoderma. Then Beset in 1991 probably or 1990 uh, worked on the same idea of Rafai based on uh, phenotypic characters and he was able to identify 27 species. And uh, instead of aggregates, he went into idea of calling them sections. So he identified five sections. At this same time, or in late 1990s, molecular phylogeny started and Kinderman and et al, and Dr. Samuel was one of them, I was working on taxonomy of trichoderma based on ITS and uh, they were able to identify many species and they, they related it to the work of Bissiat and uh, Defy, as I show you in the next slide. So this is the work of, this is a tree based on ITS. As we see, the isolates that uh, Bissiat and Defy worked on is divided into two groups. This is one. And this is another one. And Bisset called all these uh, Pachybasium section and called these trichoderma section. But there is some problem with his taxonomy. For example, these three, he put them in Pachybasium section, but in fact, in fact, they go, they should be with the trichoderma section as the tree shows. And this isolate here. He put it in Pachybasium section because it's light color, but in fact, it should be in trichoderma section based on the tree. As to Rafai work, uh, I just go with the diamond one. The diamond was is hematum aggregate. And we see from this that he was correct that trichoderma hematum is here. And some of the nearest isolates are also here. But you see diamonds everywhere else. So, oh, sorry. So that really means that uh, 
phenotypic character doesn't work with trichoderma. It's just you don't have much to work with. And there is, there is a lot of uh, homoplasia within phenotypic characters. And also plasticity. Plasticity meaning that characters change at, uh, under different environment or different media. So it's impossible to work a phenotypic character to classify trichoderma. That's why uh, beginning 2000, people started using molecular taxonomy and that led that never uh, go up from about 40 to about 400 in just uh, maybe 10 years. Then after this work of using ITS, people started using multi-locus phylogeny. And this was the first paper about multi-locus phylogeny. And uh, we, we, we were working at this time and we were doing multi-locus phylogeny just like everybody else. But multi-locus phylogeny, as I point out, it's still very good uh, to use for phylogeny of trichoderma. Later, uh, about 2005, Dr. Durzhinina and I think her husband developed an, uh, a website that would tri identify trichoderma based on ITS and TEF. Right now, they say you need three, not just two, but three, uh, three local lo loci to identify trichoderma. So, if you do multi locus phylogeny, how do you do it? Well, what, what, what's the protocol? Here are the steps to do multi locus phylogeny. The first step is DNA extraction. Uh, this is, you all know about it. You can use kits or you can use your own reagent. If you, for example, here, we always use kit, kits from different companies to extract DNA, but you can use any method. And then you do PCR. Right now, uh, it's suggested that these are the best, the best uh, genes for Trichoderma phylogeny, TEF or translation elongation factor, RPB2 and ITS. Once you do PCR, then you just sequence it. You sequence the PCR and you always, you have to use both strands, sequence both strands, not just one. Because in one of them, you might get some ambiguity so you can identify it by the other strand. Once you have the raw sequences, you assemble them by usually soft, definitely software. And I was using Squatchers. This is a very good one. Uh, once you have the sequence, what do you do with it? You blast it. Uh, blast will tell you the <coughs> closest relative to, to your sequence or the most homolog homologous sequences. And you want to bring them into your phylogeny uh, you download them in faster format. Then once you have, <coughs> once you have the sequ your sequences and sequence from uh, reference sequences from GenBank, you align them. And for this, you use uh, some software like Cluster or there, right now there are tools online, so you don't even have to use anything. You just, there are websites you go to and you align your sequences. Then you, you have to refine your, your alignment manually. Most of the times do, those programs do not do a very good job. So you have to yourself be able to um, correct areas where the alignment is not that good. Also, you really need to identify the areas in the alignment that, uh, that's ambiguously aligned. You, and you have to uh, exclude it when you do make trees. So I correct your alignment and identify areas that's ambiguously aligned so that you could uh, 
discard them or not uh, use them in the in making tree. And when you make trees, you can use different. Right now, you can use a lot of software like Mega, Power, Bayesian. Definitely, there are many more. Uh, so this is uh, one of one of the work we did. Them as parallel. We didn't know if this species is one or two. We had big, big collection of asperellum. Uh, so when we were sequencing, we were looking, finding that we could find two different kind of sequences, and we were using TF. Basically, we were we started using TF before anybody else. So we were seeing two sequences. It was so so straightforward that this definitely has to be two species. It just was very strange. <laughs> How could somebody else didn't find this? Why, why us? So this is, uh, this is all our isolates of, they were called uh, Asprelum in our uh, the collection of cultures. So when we did TF, we see that clearly we see two lineages. We call them cryptic species one, one, two and cryptic species one. Crypt, cryptic meaning it is, um, it cannot be identified by phenotypic characters. Cryptic is, uh, the word is Greek meaning hidden. And we also see a third lineage. This is, we have one isolate of the closest relative of Asprelum and it is an isolate from China, Yunnanese. And this is TF, and we go to another gene, RPB2, and we find the same thing, cryptic species one, and here the, another cryptic species two. In fact, RPB2 uh, divided them farther, even this one into two clades. But we don't want to go that far. Uh, we just say there is more speciation in progress because only this gene could find that, uh, that this group. Other genes could not find it. Here is actin and cryptic species one is very clear clay, but cryptic species two, uh, we don't have a real clay for it. It's, they are all together, but not, Real clay like here, not monophyletic, but in fact, it's it has polytomy uh, relationship to this clay. So now we have we have th this analysis. What do we do with it? What how do we define species? So for that, you have to go to this paper or based on this what Dr. Taylor published in 2000, genealogical concordance phylogenetic species recognition. Basically, what he says, what he's, the summary of what he says is, you have to use phylogeny of several unlinked genes. Why unlinked? Because linked genes could be considered just one. The linked genes could have gone through the same history. If mutation happened in one of them, it could have happened in the other one because of proximity that they are very close to each other. Also, if you do multi-locus phylogeny, the clay must be present or concordant in the majority of the gene trees. Concordant meaning they are in agreement in all, in, in majority of the gene trees. And the, in the others, which they are not there, it's, there should not be contradiction. For example, one isolate doesn't jump from one clay to the other. And if you have met those two conditions, then you can say this is, independent lineage and you can describe it as new species. And that's exactly what we, what we saw for the Asperellum. Uh, we saw that the clades, the Asperellum were, were divided into two clades in uh, TEF and RPB2. And we didn't have any contradiction in actin. So that's why we call them Asperellum and Asperelloides. And here you see that based on growth on two different media, we do not see any differences. This is Asperelloides and this is Asperellum. And they, 
just look the same. Also, I must, I must say something very strange about this. Um, uh, most of the time you isolate both of them in the same areas. For example, you could isolate them in soil very close to each other. So how could, how did this speciation happen? And why we, why we find them so close to each other? Well, the only explanation for this is that uh, species got dispersed by wind through millions of years. And that's what happened. So probably at certain time in history, millions of years ago, they were separated and developed into two different species. But right now they become dispersed by wind through long, long history. Uh, we also try to uh, support our, our our phylogeny with anything we can get. So we use this multi twelve mass spectroscopy, and it's really a long this abbreviation for a long name. If I read all of this half of the time, it would be gone probably. Um, anyway, the method is used for identification of bacteria, and some limited work on fungi has been done. What the technique does is that uh, it will. Uh, it will uh, ionize proteins or uh, large molecules such as protein and hydrophobins uh, on the on the out, on the walls of the fungi and based on that you will get a pattern and you must have a real good database to compare and identify uh, the fungi but in our case at that time there was no database and this one wasn't done by me it was done by one of our collaborator in Europe. So this is the tree that we got. Uh, this is a dendrogram based on a peak present in one of them and that is not present in the other one. So cryptic species one, you, we find that it, this is a crate for cryptic species one and cryptic species two, all the isolates are together here. So basically the technique identified about 80% to 90% of the isolate, but there is some minor problems. For example, uh, these cryptic species one, uh, four or five of them went with cryptic species two. So that's contradiction. And these cryptic species two isolates are outside this clade here, and it's, they are out, definitely outside this clade. So, the technique probably at that time needed uh, standardization or make it better, or perhaps the technique can isolate, can uh, identify things even uh, multi-local phylogeny cannot identify. I'm not sure about that. So then we. I, now I talk about another phylogeny or multilocus phylogeny of another isolate, and it is called Trichoderma stromaticum. And we didn't have any, <clears throat> nobody knew anything about the relatives for this or the closest relatives for this species. So that's why we started the work. Uh, and this stromaticum is found in South America of Brazil, Ecuador, Peru, and it's a parasite of this pathogen, Moniliostra, and this is pathogen of cacao, pure broma cacao. So whenever, and uh, stromatic is parasite of this, so whenever this pathogen of cacao goes into cacao, stromaticum will also be there. And this is the disease caused by that the Monulophra, and it's called witch's broom of cacao. Uh, witch's broom, the, basically the leaves fall and the branches will appear just like a broom and at, later will die. But it's, you see it's a broom, but it's not very good broom. Uh, also, there was some work done by Another person, this is a scientist from Brazil, De Souza. He found that the, the isolates 
from Brazil, uh, Ecuador, and Colombia could be divided into two groups based on AFLP. AFLP, as we know, it, it targets the whole genome. So we wanted to see if, if that's true, if we try multi-locus phylogeny. And he also was saying that AFLP could groups have ecological and biological differences. The other reason why we did phylogeny because we never knew any relatives for this. For example, if stromaticum is a biocontrol and kills that pathogen of cacao, how about the relatives of this pathogen, of this uh, stromaticum? We didn't know anything about, nobody knew anything because we didn't have phylogeny for it. And that's a good reason to do phylogeny. So, with that, I start showing the trees. This is uh, a tree based on calmodulin. Calmodulin is one of the genes used for phylogeny of trichoderma. And this is all the isolates of, trico of stromaticum, trichoderma stromaticum. And it's support well supported because the line is thickened. The red colors are isolates that have been uh, purified from hypochilia, the sexual stage. Here you also see the uh, minor clades. These are what I call the relatives of stromaticum, the closest relatives of stromaticum. And we found them in our culture collection because Dr. Samuel was visiting everywhere uh, for sample collection and uh, we had huge collection of trichoderma, and we found that these are very close to stromaticum, and nobody knew about them. And this is a tree based on chitinase. And again, stromaticum just one clade. We don't see two clades. So, and we see these small clades, and these small clades were. Uh, really in agreement, but we had really good agreement between all the trees. That means in congruent. Um, if they are uh, present in all the trees and one species, one isolate doesn't jump from one tree to the other, then we could identify them as new species. This is a tree based on RPB. In fact, RPB2 is the only gene that could identify two groups. This is A and B. And these groups really were uh, corresponding with the groups of Dr. De Souza. And here, the next relatives of stromaticum, all of them present in the same position. And TF also did not divide them into two groups, just one group of stromaticum. And the other uh, isolates also present, the same clays corresponding to whatever we had in other trees. And this is multi-locus uh, tree. In fact, you really don't, based on Dr. Taylor's um, definition how we identify new species you don't need it but most of the people doing it and i do it i was doing it also we were doing it just because you will get nicer tree and better separation of the branches because you will have more characters that could you could use for differentiation of the species So these clays, as I said, were present in all, were consistently present in all the, the genes, and therefore we named them new species, and they were described in the paper, about uh, eight new species. And uh, again, we go back to what Dr. Taylor says, that we should use unlinked genes and we look if we have uh, the same clades in all the gene, in all the trees or not, if we have contradiction, uh, if these mere met, then we could name new species. In our case, for stromaticum, as I showed the trees, 
only one tree, only one gene tree showed that we could divide them into two, but the others did not. So we just follow what Dr. Taylor says. We, have, we must see the crazy majority of the trees. We didn't see that, and therefore we just kept names traumaticum. We didn't divide them into two names, and that's how it should be done. But the others, the small ones, <clears throat> we named all of them because all of them were present in the same clade in different gene trees, in, in all the uh, single gene trees. One, one strange thing about uh, those relatives of stromaticum, none of them were present in South America. So we have stromaticum in South America, but the relatives were from Africa and from, uh, from Asia. So how could that be? Why, why we don't have the close relatives of stromaticum in South America? Well, the, the explanation for this would be just, it's a matter of probability and sampling. Probably if people go and take more samples and identify, then we will see them. We will see uh, close relatives of stromaticum in South America. <clears throat> there is one, one tree based on 700 genes. It's also from the famous person on trichoma, Dr. Kubacek. So they have this tree based on 700 genes because they had sequenced the whole genome for them. So they were able to identify 700 genes and use them for phylogeny. And this is section trichoderma isolates, uh, Aspirellum, Hamatum, Atroveridae, Gamsi. And this is uh, section Longibratiatum isolates. And these are uh, Pachybasium section. So uh, should we say that we shouldn't do multi locus phylogeny, just we should, because just we can do whole genome sequences and we do uh, sequence based on that many genes? Uh, my answer is no. What I see in this tree is exactly what we always see in uh, multi locus phylogeny. And that means the genes we are working on, like RPB2 and TF or ITS or Calmodulin for trichoderma, all of them are good genes and correspond very well to whole genome of the of the of the species. So definitely, whole genome doesn't is not necessary uh, for trees for trichoderma. It's just going to be a waste of time and waste of money uh, for the purpose of phylogeny just multi-locus phylogeny still should be valid and still should be very good. But for other purposes, like uh, you want to know nutrition and microparasitism or uh, physiology, then definitely whole genome will help. And you need to identify the genes involved in processes. So we, when we do, when we were doing phylogeny, multi-locus phylogeny, we were always trying to also get support from anything phenotypic characters that we see. So we were looking at uh, phenotypic character, mac macroscopic characters. That means looking at them, looking at the plates, conidial color, conidial matrix, conidial radius, colonial characters, and growth rate. And for microscopic characters, we will we will try to determine conidal dimension, conidal morphology, conidal orientation, conidal force, phyllides, and chlamydospores. And all these will, will be presented in pictures in the papers. And I mentioned something: growth rate. Growth rate is very important to determine. Usually, if you have two two species, you Sometimes, most of the time, you find some differences in growth rate. But when you do growth rate, you really have to do it in very standardized way. Uh, for example, media has to be fresh. 
prepared at the same time for all the plates and distributed by machines, not by hand, because you want equal volume of media in the plates. And we were always using two different media, like cornmeal and SNA. SNA is a um, minimal media. It's uh, this correspond to a German name. I, I don't remember now what the name was, but it's a minimal media and it doesn't have much nutrients. And we were using five temperatures, 15 to 35. Usually op optimum temperature was between 25 and 30. But some species can grow well at 35, some species grow well at 15. And these are important things that we have to record and present it in our publication. And the plugs that you use on the place to start growth uh, also has to be standardized. And we were using tools and five millimeter diameter plugs were used for our growth trial work. And for each year temperature, we were using triplicate plates and repeating the experiment three times. And then we were measuring growth in millimeter and recorded daily. And finally, we were determining growth rates just from like the, how many millimeter per day can grow and, or how many millimeter per hour. And this was done by simple equations uh, in Microsoft Excel. Now, what to do with new species? What, what other things my colleagues has to do with them? Well, the first thing you have to preserve them. Uh, oh, we are always preserving them and it's better to preserve them two methods or three methods because you don't know new species, how, how it, what method is good for it. So most of the time we were saving them on slants uh, with low sugar medium. If you have used uh, slants with high sugar, they will die fast because they grow rapidly and they die fast. So we were using like cornmeal lager instead of uh, potato dextrose lager. We, we never used potato dextrose lager. And we are also using vials and cutting a piece from the agar plates and putting them in vials with 20% glycerol. Also, you must database everything. I, I don't know if you have database or not for your work, but we, were, we had good database system, uh, software and we were using it. And you have to record host, country, location, person identified, the new species, date, sequence available, you put them in the same location. You also definitely need to deposit them in some well-known institute and CBS in Netherlands is very good one. We were depositing all our cultures there or ATCC in the US. And this is definitely something good. If you lose your culture, you, you for some reason you go back to them and you say, but they might charge you. You could say, how could that be? But that's good reason to be careful about your culture. Well, uh, we did about maybe 20 some work like the, those, like uh, multi-locus phylogeny, and they all have been published. But I want to talk some about agriculture and biocontrols also. So why biocontrol has some advantage over synthetic pesticides or chemical pesticides? The advantage is here, I summarize them. Uh, low cost, lower cost than synthetic pesticides. The, this is very important. Not, uh, not toxic secondary metabolites motobili for birds, insects, mammals. So it wouldn't hurt any of these. We won't keep environment cleaner, especially these days. Uh, they disappear quickly. It's, they are not like synthetic chemicals. And they are also targeted. They work on special or some pathogen, but not in every, on everything. Also reduce cost when you use it in combination with other pesticides like copper based. So sometimes uh, 
if you use both of them together, you could lower the concentration of the chemical one. So how trichoderma interacts with plants? Usually it's uh, colonized the outer layer of plant roots and established chemical communication with the plant. This result initially in induction of resistant mechanism to pathogens. So it will give it resistance against other pathogens. And it has been shown that uh, trichoderma can also give resistance to abiotic stress such as water or temperature. Also, there are some papers say that it, the, the plants will be able to use nitrogen if effectively or efficiently. And for example, we could use lower amount of fertilizers and that will reduce cost without affecting yield. And also this will lead to uh, reduction in nitrogen water pollution. And there are some, they say it will increase, or trichoderma increases photosynthesis efficiency. Uh, effect of trichoderma sometimes is very specific. Sometimes it works with some genotype of plant, but doesn't work with other genotypes. So we should be aware of that. Uh, I want to show this one from Dr. Harmon from uh, Cornell. He has a lot of work on trichoderma and biocontrol. Um, this is two plants of tomato plants. One of them had uh, trichoderma had cyanum in the pot with the soil. The other didn't. And when they were both exposed to uh, water stress, they didn't give them water for some days. You see this one is about to die, but this was still vibrant and very green. This is a biocontrol work we did with our, some of our collaborators in Indonesia. Uh, the, uh, the chocolate plant in Indonesia, they are facing a disease called VSD, vascular streak dieback disease of cacao. It's caused by a pathogen called Ceratobacidium theobromae. Actually, we sequenced this because, and we made some phylogeny and published a paper about it. Then we, uh, our collaborators were able to isolate more than 20 trichoderma sprelum as endophytes. And then they used four of them uh, as biocontrol. They, they, they mixed it with seeds and then they grow the seeds, the seeds became plant, and then they exposed the, the plants to VSD pathogen. They were sprayed with the pathogen. Uh, three of the asprelum were able to protect cacao plants from the disease, as I show you here. This is uh, the experiment. We have, this is positive control. The plant did not was not exposed was not treated with astrelium, and when when uh, uh, challenged with the pathogen, it got the disease. These three, they were uh, treated with astrelium, and when challenged with the pathogen, they didn't get the disease. And this one was treated with this uh, isolate of astrelium but still get the disease. So not all the strains work, just three of them. This fourth one didn't work well. A negative control, which was, uh, what wasn't subjected to the pathogen, but was sprayed just with water, did not get the disease. This was after eight weeks, and this is after 10 weeks, and this is after 12 weeks. And we see the same pattern and the disease does, uh, increase, the incidence increases. And here are just in general the procedures to when you, to the procedure for developing a biocontrol product. First, identify the problem, understand the crop and the target, what pathogen you have, what's the problem. Second, 
find the right culture. Uh, usually the culture you find usually should be in the same area uh, where the plant is. And as say for biological activity, you find the biological activity in lab, mode of action determine, and find a formulation method and uh, also do some work on shelf life. Uh, preserve your culture and register your product. So it's not easy task. Uh, this is uh, some biocontrol products based on trichoderma. And uh, this is from Dr. Samuel's book. He has a book, Trichoderma. And I specifically, he, he had about 50 products. I specifically copied this page because you see this one. Three of the products are from India. And the isolates involved in these products are trichoderma veridi, trichoderma veridi, and herziana. And they, they mention what, what plants or crops they, uh, they suggest to be used with. So this is something very positive. Uh, I'm sure it has, the number of products has increased a lot by now. Uh, the book was published in 2015, but probably he collected the, this information long before that. Uh, what I did here is that uh, I took all the products that, have, that were published in Dr. Samuel's paper, and then put the countries in from what countries we see more products. And surprisingly, I saw that more, most the country which has more products based on trichoderma was New Zealand. And then Vietnam is had good amount and USA, but India and Germany had about five products. As I said, the, this is all data, but it has increased a lot, but still among the top countries. And that's something you should be proud of. And what species did they use? So again, I, I plotted what species were in those products in the book of Dr. Samuel. And this is what I found, that most of the product had herzianum and some products, they didn't mention what they had. Either they didn't know or they didn't identify it, or they just want to keep it for themselves. Trichoderm atroveridae is also very common for biocontrol. Veridae, parsimonosum, and asprella, gamsi, veridae, hamatum, conenziae, risciae. Uh, this is really something very, this is very few. The, it, if, you, we, if we say we have about 500 species now, this is about 10 or 11, it's only about 2%. So how about the others? So there's a lot of work to be done to find, to see if other, other species have activity or not. I just don't know why so few. Probably these are the common ones, just as, as I show some slides. These are very common that you could, find, but we don't know all others that are not that common. Are they good biocontrol or not? So that could, that could be worked on in future. So here I tell you what will happen in the world in 2050. Population jumps, this is based on World Health Organization. Population jumps about 30, 4% to 9.1 billion. And urbanization will continue. Most about 70% of the world will be urban. Income will be higher and people will need more calorie and better food. To feed this large, more urban, richer population, you need about 70% more food. Who could do this? Uh, so it's it's going to be collective effort between farmers, scientists, engineers, retailers, business leaders, government, all these have to work together and find solution for this 
huge amount, this big task. And your position is going to be among probably top of these scientists to, to tackle this big job. And here are some approaches that could be done uh, in future. For example, robot farming, soil sustain sustainability, water conservation, and slow aging of vegetables. We waste about 30% of what we produce because of diseases, of, because of the right fast. So if we slow down that, we could save a lot. And I will end my talk with this slide. This is number of publication in PubMed. It was published, it, I think Dr. Dulcinina put it in one of her papers. And the jump in publications and also countries that produces those papers. Here we see that China is definitely number one without any challenge. But the good thing is that India is number two and we should all be very proud of that. Uh, even though it has been declining in, in the recent days, but still very good. But still very good uh, comparable to USA and Brazil. And we hope that this will continue. And uh, it's not just publication. You are not just there for publication. You also, there's another job you should do, and that's to train, to train people. Just before you leave or retire or to, to go another job, find better, good people to continue the work. So this big, uh, your job would continue and you give your lab into a good hands. With that, I finish my talk, and uh, if there are questions, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, sir. Mm, it was such a comprehensive talk, uh, and uh, you have started right from the day um, in 90s when you have started doing work with the ITS 1-2, and um, mm, you end up your talk with a number of publications um, which around the globe people are publishing in trichoderma. Also, you have mentioned about the significant volume of work which we have done along with Dr. Samuel and uh, contributed a lot uh, in the study of trichoderma for all we people we who are working a little bit some, uh, around the globe on the work in trichoderma. Now, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Now, I'll, uh, I, I'm very much sure that uh, so many questions must be there in mind of many people. Um, I request uh, uh, for the questions and good interaction with Dr. Mike. I can see Dr. Pramila Devi, ma'am. I request, ma'am, you, you to start uh, the discussion. Yes, ma'am. I don't hear anything. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And your comprehensive taxonomy of uh, this uh, trichoderma have given lots of uh, both the morphological and also the molecular characterization uh, using uh, different uh, hmm, genes. And uh, here also in our lab, we started working on this taxonomy of trichoderma. Uh, sir, I have one question. Here, uh, we have done uh, uh, almost uh, 300 to around 300 uh, uh, trichoderma cultures, which were uh, uh, earlier identified and uh, deposited as viridi. But when we have taken those, uh, taken out those uh, ITS sequences and also the uh, depositions as viridi only based on morphology and uh, some collections of our uh, this thing, um, uh, trichoderma also. But uh, to our surprise, everything uh, at molecular level, they have come as a trichoderma aspirella. And uh, when we have gone to the in details of uh, this uh, uh, taxonomy of uh, this trichoderma viridi and uh, aspirella, there is a lot of, I mean, a very minute uh, difference. Like uh, uh, 
uh, uh, roughness of uh, these uh, spores and uh, that uh, roughness uh, is not uh, i mean uh, um, very much seen under this uh, compound microscope also and another uh, main uh, difference here is the presence of clamdospores but uh, whatever we have observed uh, in india almost uh, and uh, two three other scientists who are working in their labs regarding this trichoderma taxonomy also they found that uh, uh, all uh, indian isolates which we identified were uh, trichoderma asprillum only and there okay. is no viridi and uh, my question is yeah, here is uh, sir do you, did you find the trichoderma viridi uh, in your isolates and is, is there any difference between these viridi isolates and asprillum isolates at morphological level this yeah, is uh, i think i uh, enlighten us sir. I, I think so, yes, there are differences. And if you go back to uh, the publication when those, when, well, I could give you some publication later, but uh, if you go back to so, some of old publications, yes, description should point out some differences, but uh, you don't have to do that. Just go to the sequence. The sequence should be clear. ITS, ITS should, should be able to differentiate Veridi from Asprelum. And Veridi is not that common. So a lot of people put Veridi, but in fact, they are very uncommon. It's, uh, it's uh, actually it's Northern areas, like Northern Europe uh, isolate. It's probably not in tropical. Okay. So basically, just go to the sequence. You don't. Uh, yeah. uh, but if you want morphological, just some old papers and uh, Dr. Samuel's papers. Yes, or some yeah. uh, some probably before I joined him, yeah. he has some papers, and I can find it for you, and it will tell you description. But uh, at the beginning, when when isolates are the, uh, described, then at, the, at that paper you will find all the description okay thank you sir uh, so whatever we have uh, observed and also the new isolates also they were coming as aspiral only uh, that, I mean, through and common. also tap region both ways that's and even other uh, regions also beta tubulin also we have done and uh, um, another uh, i think beta tubulin only we have done and all uh, regions they were showing aspiral aspiral only and uh, the earlier deposits also, even some of them are uh, um, wrongly deposited in NC, um, NCPA. So those sequences we have again uh, blasted. There uh, they were coming as asprilum only. So then uh, that's what, that was uh, our uh, doubt whether uh, really uh, Viridi uh, no, is really. available because earlier all the deposits like uh, all uh, uh, publications were uh, in the name of Viridi only, not the asprilum. I, I believe they are all Australian. That's correct. Very D is not that common. Yes. Okay, sir. Thank you. With this, we have a perception in that in India we don't that trichoderma already don't exist. Uh, so, uh, ma'am, can we yeah. go with this con con with this conclusion that trichoderma already do not exist in India? Yeah. Yeah, I, I believe so. I believe I believe you should you should have that such, that in mind. Yes. No, but uh, Adnan, I think um, if you go to the temperate parts of the country, you could get viridi. Oh, really? okay. Please un Northern unscreen part. your slides. Unscreen your slides. Uh, 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 please unscreen your slides. Stop sharing your slides. Stop sharing. Slide. Oh, oh, stop sharing. Uh, we'll have okay. good interaction. Uh, I don't know how to. There is an option stop sharing. So there you can click. So, video. so one more scientist from uh, Bangalore, Sri Ram, uh, in 2013 itself, he is also having the, the same observation. And uh, he called okay. me and uh, he had. Uh, he was asked me also uh, for my observation. Then I told him the same thing. So even I have prepared one review article also on that, but uh, it's not yet published. 
and uh, uh, those who are working on trichoderma taxonomy in india ha are having uh, the same uh, uh, i mean uh, notion that uh, viridi is not uh, existing in india it is only asparellum well just go to the go to the sequence <laughs> the, the the correct answer would be just look at the sequence and blast it and if you use Genbang, that will be fine. And if you just depend also on uh, good scientists who deposited it. So there are some some bad some people who did uh, maybe uh, incorrect so far, so far identification. Not, so far, we have not uh, observed any viridi. So far, but maybe we may get later. But uh, yeah. definitely, that is different. As viridi is uh, different from the asparilla. Those two yeah. species are different, but there are very little um, I mean, uh, differences between these two. Yes, definitely, they are both in section trichoderma. Yeah. Yes. Dr. Desai, please. And this is, this is a very good thing. I think, uh, Dr. Pamela, uh, yes, uh, this discussion shows that you have to give a write up for the IPS, Indian phytopathology, because most yeah. some of the papers are coming as a trichoderma viridi. So I think uh, we have to discourage them. Either they have to correct the identification. Yeah. So we, you have to I, write I, I, something. Yeah, I submitted sir. to this in Indian phytopathology. And, uh, and there was some review, so then uh, uh, I yeah, got to. We need a paper from you. Sure. Uh, very important. This is very important thing yeah, for sir. the Indian researcher. Yeah. yeah. I'll do yeah. this. I'll do this. Thank you. Dr. Desai, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, good afternoon. In fact, I was uh, waiting for this lecture right from the morning. And in fact, I called up Dr. Gogoi also as to what happened. I'm not getting the link to join the meeting. So he told me that it has been postponed to this afternoon. It was a very informative lecture. But then uh, at the end of the lecture, when I saw your last slide, I came to where well, are we back to square one from person to refi to Bisset to Kubisek to Again, back to square one as to are we st still clear about the entire taxonomy as on today? Because if I read some of the QB6 papers, they still say that some of these ITS1, ITS2 differences, what we are using, it's a few uh, you know, two, three base space differences and all those things. So yeah. how far are you accurate about it? Well, uh, you do, you, um... If you really want to identify species, then ITS is not good. Yeah. You have to do three genes. No, but uh, TF... TF1, even if you take the TEF also, TEF1, it, it, within that also there are intron differences. Some suggest for the fourth one, some suggest for the fifth intron. There are, again, there are differences. So. Uh, I, I think, I think, uh, Dr. Dr. Durzinina, she has a website and she uses those the three genes, RTB2, yeah. TEF, ITS, and those really be clear that it will identify 100%. But uh, Durzinina has if not, the conclusion that not, now we should probably move for a barcoding system rather than all these things. One of her recent papers, she suggests that let us, we should move for the barcoding system now. I don't know what the, using just one gene or multiple no. genes. All the uh, what uh, now the Zinina's recent paper suggests is that between uh, you take the difference between ITS1 and ICS2 and then develop the barcodes. Probably that could be because even 77 isolates eight uh, species, whatever we are talking of it, are we really clear about these things? Because as Dr. Rakesh Pandey clearly mentioned, many of the places still we are with old system asparillum or asparilloides or between these two are viridae, viridae and harrison, so many problems, so many issues are there as far as taxonomy is concerned in case of trichoderma because we started off them as the species groups and still I think we are there only. Sir, uh, uh, just a minute, sir. Uh, sir, uh, as far as my knowledge goes, my experience goes with this uh, trichoderma taxonomy between this asperlum and viridi, um, and uh, uh, somebody is asking for the clarification also. Sir, do you agree with me? And uh, if we see the morphologically, if the clamdospores are present, if the, you can see the clamdospores, it is definitely asperlum. 
and uh, you know as for the literature there is no there are no clamado spores in viridi this literature as per the literature so this is at morphological difference between otherwise uh, spores wise and the culture wise we can't differentiate unless you go for molecular and then uh, definitely molecular uh, you can see and then its uh, those who can go for molecular identification can definitely go whether it is viridi or aspirillum but uh, those who can't do the molecular at morphological level itself if they want to differentiate and this is the main difference what i found is clamados presence of clamados spores and uh, uh, no so the plus uh, if the clamados spores are there then it is aspirillum if the clamados spores are not there uh, it is viridi because whatever the cultures i have observed here in india so far i have, which i have observed and uh, all were uh, producing clamados spores and why i was looking for the clamados spores also and uh, as per the literature also it is there and in viridi there were no there are no clamados spores sir do you agree with me with this uh, I, I I wasn't doing taxonomy based on uh, phenotypic character. Dr. Samuel was doing. I was just doing uh, molecular. But I agree with what you say. If, if okay. I don't, I, there is no reason for me to not to believe you. Yeah. yeah but I see that clamidospores can be induced using various uh, other uh, metabolites from bacteria and all those things. So in that case, then again, it becomes a questionable thing. Okay. It's a very important point of discussion, at least for the first time coming in trichoderma. And what Dr. Desai is telling, really it is happening. I think we have to become very serious about this in future publication, especially because as Dr. Pramila told that most of the species are not trichoderma variety. So I think we have to, you have to give some data, Pramila, from different region of the India, because you are getting a collection from everywhere. Yes. And then it will be better you yeah. confirm it. It is yes. more than 90% or 95%. Yeah. Trichoderma beauty is not trichoderma beauty, but it is trichoderma yes. as well. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, trichoderma yes. variety is very rare. Very yeah. rare. Yeah, this has been shown even by Dr. Ardi Prasad and his team, and we are all working together that whatever we are working with, they're all aspirillum only, not the very days. But then the, we can't rule out that we don't have aspirillum in India. I mean, every day in India because it's a temperate uh, species basically. So I think we should be able to get in temperate regions. We haven't looked for it from the diversity point of view. And uh, Dr. Pandey, as you said, uh, in fact, uh, uh, in Dusinina's paper only, she uh, totally rules out about 20 to 25 blast sequences, which are wrongly submitted in the NCBI. Yeah, you are right. You are right, sir, because the paper, what coming in the Indian phytopathology, I'm talking only about Indian phytopathology, when paper is going to expert, expert is looking the paper, exactly yeah. what work has been done, how it has been done, and what is the importance of this work, what is the applied aspect. But we have never think that uh, what species he is writing, is it correct or not? Yeah. There we have not the given our attention. To, should be done, sir. This is a very important point to now today discussing. But these days, sir, we, more, if we are... Sorry, one more confirmation from uh, Dr. Ismail also, and I uh, recorded my aspirillum as a biocontrol agent. That's uh, aspirillum species as a biocontrol agent. Till now, yeah, mostly yeah. every day as a biocontrol agent, and aspirillum is not shown much. And uh, in his uh, slides, also aspirillum as a biocontrol agent. So, this viridi and uh, uh, aspirillum, it's almost uh, uh, like uh, very near, sir. As mostly it may be the aspirillum only. And uh, even in our lab, also, then we have done the um, uh, even biocontrol studies also. There also, um, uh, we found it as aspirillum only, not the viridi. Uh, even ma'am, uh, when I have collected the samples from southern Rajasthan uh, and I have submitted uh, with ITS and TEF, I found it aspirillum only. And yeah. among among that aspirillum, that uh, one strain is very effective against many soil borne pathogens. Yeah. So um, aspirillum has a very good potential. You know, as I, a I published it, sir, by, by, by different uh, genes I have done for uh, many isolates and. Uh, uh, that paper also, multi-gene uh, paper also I have uh, published. And uh, there also all, uh, whatever the collection yes. I have taken. Uh, and nice. Nice. Even in the case of chitinase gene, what you're talking of, endochitinase gene, endochitinase is a family. So which gene exactly we are talking of? That's another chitin gene, whatever we are talking of, 
there is a lot of diverse uh, i mean diversity in the kite to, to zine also what we are talking about when we are probing for that so that's also a question it's great so, sir one question so yeah. this is gopi from kannur okay Sir, actually, like at the time of uh, isolation of trichoderma, the growth is uh, uh, very good, and also we can find a good sporulation. But after some time, what happens? Actually, like the growth also not there, but the media has been changed to like fluorescent yellow color. So, what could be the reason? Um, you, uh, maybe scanty growth, or there is no growth of trichoderma, but the media has been changed to fluorescent yellow color. So, what could be the reason? So is there any contaminant or? No, 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 no. This is a trichoderma harzianum. Can I answer that? Can I answer that? And uh, yes. mostly this is a lanky growth in some isolates. What I have also observed in the lab. Lanky practicum. Uh, very, very light growth will be there. It is yeah, not yeah. completely, it is not there. If you make the slide and uh, see under microscope, you can see the growth. And uh, the sporulation also will be less, but uh, the, usually the harzianum in some of the most of the isolates, it uh, becomes brown in color. So the it uh, changes. But anyway, you have to confirm. You have to see the yeah, slide. But and the see that that. Like, then only like, you can say it is harzianum. Otherwise, just not by that uh, color change, you can't say it is harzianum. Mostly, I'm telling you about it. No, but that, that is true. But uh, how we can improve the sporulation under this condition? How to improve the sporulation because it's not producing spore at all. In the beginning, there was a good sporulation, and even in the dual culture study, it was doing well. But after some time, if we do it, uh, that uh, there is no sporulation, then what is the use of that culture? Sporulation will be there. You you just uh, make the slide and see. There will no, be sporulation. There. Definitely, it will be there. Definitely, it will be there. But the thing is that like what we expect, that much we don't get. Mm, it is you... like. We we you we do an uh, PDM only. You can try uh, this uh, trichoderma specific medium. Okay. We have and not tried that. Dr. Gopi, this is very good thing. You have to do the research. There may be yes. some stress factor. You can apply and you will get more respiration. Yes. yes. This is a matter of research, I think. No, no, because this is the ideal forum to discuss. That's why I discuss it. No, that's a good thing. That's a yeah. good thing. We should discuss it. But yes, we have to try that there may be some stress factor. If you apply yes, some stress factor, some yes, you give temperature or something like that, you will get more sporulation. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. even like, sometimes you can modify a little bit media, then you can get more good effect also. Even, okay. even, even sir, agitation okay. is also important. Yes. Agitation. Yeah, okay, sir. As, as yeah, that also increases sporulation. Yes. yes, sir. Thank you, sir. If you use light and darkness uh, alternative, then you will get more sporulation. Okay. Alternative, alternative light and dark. Yes. Light and dark. Yes. 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 You can try with your own isolate. 12, 12 hours each. Okay. Any more? What is happening is that um, when you do repeated uh, subculturings, the yes. strains lose their ability to produce pores also. And then yeah. uh, probably if you open that where you are getting that yellow color, open and then smell the plate, you will get the coconut oil flavor. Yes, so, that's very common. Uh, yeah, the smell, you get it. That's because they switch to the different metabolic pathways. That's the thing. Oh. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Actually, that's inhibitor. That coconut order inhibitor to others. And I have tested them on plates. Exactly, yes. <laughs> If you parafilm, if you put connect two plates and parafilm them, and you see yeah. it inhibits the other one. Exactly. Sir, uh, I have one more question. What is okay. your uh, thought about the native isolate? We see, we feel that um, uh, for a good biocontrol agent, we should have a native isolate. And uh, anybody who is working on trichoderma, they feel that my culture is better and, uh, and it can you work right. here. Hello? You are right. If you ask, for yeah. example, if you ask, I have uh, trichoderma different species, when I, I have isolated trichoderma from mentha, for example, a simple example I'm giving you, from mentha arvensis. So from mm -hmm. when I'm applying this uh, trichoderma hergianum, that is THU, BF patent, that, that is working very well on mentha, but if I'm applying for other hashmas or other medicinal plant, it is not working that much. 
So mm -hmm. sometimes it's work, and I think this is my experience is working very well when we are having the native oil, yeah. especially with the crop. Is Dr. Pandey, I think it's not not it's a debatable point actually. The native. No, you are right, sir. But I, I'm giving Dr. my experience. No, if you take Dr. Harman's isolates, he claims across US it works. <laughs> yes. No, that's that's correct, but I'm giving my own experience. No, but the, the point what you're mentioning is that probably the rises, uh, the root exudates which you are getting from the other uh, plants are not that compatible for the strain what you're using as compared to the one which is from the menta. That could be yes, the situation. Yes. Otherwise, it will grow comfortably very well. Yeah. So, so what do you mean by Herman's isolate? Is that T T22? Yeah, they, they, have, they have a huge claim for that, is it not? Yes, yes. Yeah. But you can you can find that isolate very commonly. Yeah. yeah. For, for example, when I was doing survey of soils, I can find the sequence exact looks exactly like it. So it is just the same. Yes. No, probably at yes, that yes. time all these restrictions were not there. The isolates have moved across the continents. <laughs> you never know that. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great discussion, at least on trichoderma. It's very important. Very important. Yes. And I think in future, we have a brainstorming session on trichoderma especially. I hope no, so. It, it, it will be happening. We are, uh, the PG-16 is there. Trichoderma Lab yes. International Workshop is there. So yeah, this, workshop and this debate, you see what debate today came for the trichoderma ability, yes, and this thing. This should come on the brainstorming. Yeah? It should be very clear, at least in India, what trichoderma we are using. Is it right trichoderma, what we are writing in our research paper? Mm -hmm. That is very important and it gives open a new door for the future science of trichoderma. I'd like to ask Dr. Pratima ma'am to share some views of her views. She's there. Pratima uh, madam, are you there? I think she is not here. Yes, that Robin with the uh, IPS web uh, site, she, she was there. I think uh, she left for some meeting. Okay, um, it's a wonderful debate, a wonderful discussion, I must say. And uh, Dr. Chakravarti, uh, do you have to say something? BN Chakravarti, sir. Uh, no, this is uh, very good, interesting uh, observations and uh, findings. It is uh, Good for all the main young generations who are working with that, all new informations which have been gathered for its taxonomical placements and all that can be worked out. And as Dr. Pandey also pointed out, to be very careful about using the term species of the trichoderma while communicating the research papers in the esteemed journals of the society. Hope that will be taken care of by all the group of the editorial boards when they are taking care about the publications of such journals, articles. And this is very good and I'm happy that uh, Professor Adnan Ismail, from starting from the beginning, from the end, he has given his very, very interesting observations, which is really thoughtful for all the readers and a working group who are working with this trichoderma. Many thanks to Dr. Adnan for your brilliant observations and your findings. I'm happy Thank that you, this has been attended by myself and also by the eminent uh, scientist, plant pathologist, which will be definitely useful for all of us. I suggest that if you can provide some of the review articles in the journals uh, in the coming forthcoming issues during this 25 year celebrations, that will be good uh, reading materials for all of us. And I hope that you will not deny to submit your articles if I will ask you for your review articles on this particular topics in the journals. Hopefully I will, I could, well, first, thank you so much for your kind words. Thank you yes. so much. Yes, uh, yes. For about the review, we are really very busy in our work, but if I can find time yes, with yes. my uh, supervisor, it will, we will do that. It, it will be given, uh, time will be definitely spare for your availability. But your observations and your findings, uh, that will be good for the readers in the broad sense. That I request, that I will 
or try to take your advantage from yourself for the reader's point of view. Is it okay, Dr. Pandey? Yes, sir. It's a great <laughs> occasion and you have invited the right person yeah. uh, for Taiko Dharma. So yeah. I'm grateful to you. At least this thing yeah, came yeah. to your mind and you have given invitation to Professor yeah. Adnan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he can he can contribute. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's a great. And that that will that will be open uh, for all the readers. They will also come to know more who could not attend this particular lectures. They can read it and they can go through it and they can keep in touch with such brilliant findings in the taxonomic yes. literature. Actually, that uh, this is actually Gary is one actually who brought in some kind of revolution in entire this one. Bringing mm. in the molecular tools for the trichodogma component. Yeah. That's uh, otherwise until then we were all going by only the species growth, morphology, cultural, and all those things. Mm. So that's one good part in that actually. Uh, but uh, for the benefit of others also, that and then I just want to ask you as to what is your take on variation in these some of these 77 or 80 are there? There are some of them are holomorphs, some of them are teleomorphs, some of them are anamorphs. How do they differentiate themselves when it comes to ITS-1 and ITS-2 differences? Are there any well, differences among them? Well, Pamela, Pamela can yeah. answer, I think. There, there is connection between them. So uh, if trichodia, for example, Veridi is hypocrya rufa, and Jericoni is Risei, but they share the same ITS. If, if you go with ITS, it should be the same. So if you if you sequence from both samples, it should be identical. No difference whatsoever. Okay. So, but but so right, right now we should all go by the, by one name and uh, with tri work with one trichoderma. Because somewhere I was reading that the once you, uh, you do hypocria versus trichoderma, you can get sometimes variations in ITS one and ITS two. That's, a, but, that's what I was just taking. I was taking uh, well, your, your take on that. <laughs> I think uh, uh, the recently they started, uh, I mean, uh, only one name for uh, one fungus, no, sir? even yeah, if it is a sexual yeah. stage or a sexual stage. Yeah. So yeah. now that confusion will not be there. So no, it yes. should be genetically, it should be the same. And uh, morphologically, of course, the uh, sexual or sexual stage, we can't have two names for the same fungus. I think this is a good idea having a single name, whether it is yeah. a sexual stage or sexual stage. Yeah, single name. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Dilip Lashman, do you have some word to say? Yeah. See, please unmute, sir. Please unmute. So, um, I'd like to say that um, uh, Ed, I call him Ed, um, is with, uh, I see him all the time together, and I know. He has great expertise, so I thought that I should bring it uh, to your attention uh, before he retires. So, so good that uh, some interaction is going and will be going in future with him with all experiences we have with trichoderma. Um, the other thing that I was just wondering, I'm not a trichoderma person. Um, the ITS2 secondary structure Sometimes, even though you know they are very, the differences are very few nucleotides, but when you convert them into secondary structure, you may see very uh, interesting observations. Uh, for example, um, you may see the mutation uh, in in a place that distort the secondary structure, the stem structure, or the mutation could cause, they're called like um, hemi-compensatory changes or compensatory changes you know, in, in molecular biology. And the minor differences in the ITS2 um, sequences could amplify when you check them in the form of secondary structure. So, I have not done myself, so I don't know how good it will work, but I have seen that um, it works very good with OATS species, for example. And recently I have done another with uh, Rhizoctonia tulipera, um, it's called tulip uh, gray valve disease. 
And I could see within, within the same species, I could see differences. And some of these differences have been attributed to, to sexual differentiation. That means, you know, if there is a compensatory base change between the two isolates of the same species, most likely they are not the same species. They could be, because the mutation have caused them uh, to change in two places for compensatory base change. And that may not have happened just by fluke or just by random chance. So this is an, another area uh, that I've, I'm pursuing on the isophenia um, isolates. Um, I don't know whether it will work with uh, like differentiating Espandlam and Viridi. Um, I'll, I'll talk with um, Ed sometimes on that. Okay, thank you. Um, before, thank you, sir. Sure. Before extending a formal word of thanks to Dr. Adnan Ismail, I must uh, thank Dr. Dilip Dashman, sir. Because of him, Dr. Adnan is here is with us today, uh, and we had a very correct. wonderful lab. <laughs> thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Most welcome. Thank you. So, on behalf of uh, Indian Phytopathological Society, I uh, extend a warm, formal vote of thanks to you, sir, for uh, delivering such a nice lecture and uh, uh, has initiated such a nice, nice discussion. And uh, it will be useful for all of us. Um, and uh, we could correct ourselves in terms of that species, Giridi or uh, definitely um, uh, we'll do it, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, thank you, sir. And as uh, Dr. Chakravarti sir said, we are expecting your uh, uh, review article on all these aspects so that it will be useful for all readers in India uh, as well as in the, around the globe. Thank you, thank you so much. Sir. I, 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 I intend to do it. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you for your response, positive to our request. Thank you. I I will definitely communicate to you and you can respond. Okay. Because Thank our you so much, all of you. Yeah, yeah. Dilip has already taken a very good initiative in the special articles. The first article, if you see, that they have compiled and given a very good extensive information on the special issues. So this issue, uh, coming forthcoming issue with your articles also will be very good immense for the all readers. Please try to spare some time as per your convenience. Thank you. I would. Thank you, sir. Mm, so it's time to say goodbye. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Goodbye sir. to all of you. Bye -bye. Have a nice Have weekend. Work for us. Yeah. yeah thanks. Oh, you too. Right? Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Sir.